one of the places where I think the, the recent machine learning can really inform the philosophical debate is by filling in some of these ellipses. Uh, uh, you know, getting rid of this whiff of magic uh, to some of these key appeals that the empiricists have made in the past and showing how a you know, vaguely brain-inspired computational mechanism could actually do some of these operations. And I think that that's the sense of wonder that a lot of people get. You know, all the, all the critics of deep learning uh, almost love to uh, then paint uh, deep learning as being the contemporary reincarnation of psychological behaviorism. And this is just totally wrong. <laughs> yeah, you know, to understand how this uh, mischaracterization started, you know, I think you have to go back to the beginning of cognitive science. This is Brain Inspired. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul. On this episode, my guest is Cameron Buckner, who is a philosopher and cognitive scientist at the University of Houston. And today we discuss two main topics Cameron has been working on. The first centers around an age-old debate in philosophy that has continued into modern questions about how to understand natural intelligence and how to build AI, artificial intelligence. And Cameron is in the final stages of a book all about this. And the debate um, goes by many names, like nature versus nurture, rationalism versus empiricism. But the question revolves around how much of our intelligence is learned from experience versus how much is innate. Or in AI, how much should deep learning models learn from scratch versus how much should we simply build in? Cameron's take on this debate is roughly that we should ask, what are the handful of psychological faculties that we possess, perception, memory, different kinds of learning, and so on? And importantly, how might these faculties be implemented in a general and flexible enough way to work with each other as interacting modules? to build up to something that we would call an intelligent system. Something like what Chris Elias Smith is working on with his Spawn cognitive architecture, which we discussed in episode 90. So a lot of Cameron's work focuses on how to think about mapping our psychological faculties onto all the different kinds of deep learning models uh, coming out, like convolutional neural networks, transformers, and so on. And that we can use these deep learning tools to essentially test what are the right handful of variations of architectures and learning rules and so on that need to be built so as to work well together? That's what we discuss in the first part of the episode. Then we switch gears a little and talk about Cameron's recent work on another age-old topic, how our mental contents, our thoughts, beliefs, desires, uh, are connected to the things that they are contents about, how our mental contents are grounded in the world. So without going into much detail here, uh, Cameron proposes our mental contents are grounded by our brain's predictions of what's about to happen, and more specifically about the learning that takes place when those predictions need to be updated due to error. So these are both huge topics, and I encourage you to learn more by diving deeper into his work, which I link to in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 142. On the website, braininspired.co, you can also learn how to support the podcast through Patreon or my online course about the intersection of neuroscience and modern AI. So please check those out if you value what I'm doing. Okay, enjoy Cameron. So Cameron, I can tell that you haven't been outside for the past at least, uh, I'd say 15 minutes because you're not dripping in sweat from the hot, soupy <laughs> Houston summer weather. You have nice air I'm, conditioning. I'm actually, I'm actually in Cambridge right now, so oh, oh, uh, where okay. that's where uh, we do the climate refugee thing every summer, where we we try to uh, do fellowships somewhere. So I'm I'm doing a fellowship uh, this summer with uh, the Center for Future for Intelligence here, that's funded by Leverholm, and uh, I'm a fellow at Clare Hall here. So it's been a it's been a lovely day here. It, it was 50 oh. Fahrenheit when we woke up and. I went for a run when it was about 60 along the cam, so don't, Beautiful. don't worry yeah. about me. I had a spectacular right. day. Uh, well, thanks for joining me here. Um, so we have potentially a ton to talk about, so we'll see what we get to. Uh, 
Uh, I know that your your sort of original background is in computer science and artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, but you've and you still are very interested in those, and we'll talk about those things. Uh, you've pivoted a lot of your work to um, philosophy, to mm -hmm. issues surrounding philosophy. Um, the, the first thing that I want to ask you, uh, in, in reading your work and watching a few of your talks, you know, you make reference to all these old philosophers. And I don't mm -hmm. know if this is, forgive me if this is a uh, hackneyed question, but I want to know how difficult it is. So when I read old philosophy, it's really difficult for someone like me, uh, whose elevator might not go to the top floor, to interpret, you know, their, the mm -hmm. meaning of what they're saying. And yeah. I have a sense that through history, every modern era, at every step, we interpret them slightly differently. Uh, is that true? Mm -hmm. and, and how difficult is it to go back to these original sources and, and interpret uh, what, they're, what they meant by their words? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had courses on the historical philosophers in grad school, so I had a bit of the training and the terminology and so on. But I, I, there is there is kind of a an initial bar to get over that's just regarding the way they use language differently and the way they structure sentences and so on. But I'm actually struck kind of in the opposite direction by once you get past that initial sort of veneer of unfamiliarity, how the philosophers I talk about like Locke and Hume are, are really grappling with the same fundamental issues that machine learning researchers are grappling with today, for example, you know, the problems of induction, for example, you know, wrote a paper sort of about that, uh, is a question. So it's just, it's the same question that confronts a, a machine learning engineer, which is how do I extract some general category representations from a finite amount of experience, right? Cause you want your, categories to be a, of uh, the right kind of abstract structure so that they'll generalize to future data that's maybe uh, slightly dissimilar to the data it's seen in the past. It's, it's basically the problem of induction, you know, and if you go through Locke and Hume's uh, treatise or inquiry, you see, you know, they're talking about how do I learn causal relationships, for example, from uh, merely sets of contingencies that I see in my past, right? And how do I learn to do geometry, you know, and how do I learn about number? And these are the problems that they, they spend pages and pages talking about. It's the same problems that, that you know, people are, are struggling with on, on the cutting edge of deep learning today. So, you know, I, I think it, it definitely is a bit daunting when you first try to jump right into it. And it, it sort of seems like you're swimming in a very unfamiliar sea. But once you get past that initial hurdle, and I think also going through a bit of secondary literature can help too, you know, so finding, finding a philosopher who's done a bit of the interpretive work connecting the, this is one of the things that I try to do in my work, right, is to give a kind of crib sheet for the machine learning engineers who are interested in, you know, what, what Locke or Hume or William James or Ibn Sina or whoever uh, what, what, thought what about these problems. What proportion of... Uh... AI researchers is that, that are interested in those? I, th I mean, I think you'd be surprised. So, you know, w one of the things I do in, in the first chapter of my, my book manuscript is I go through and I point to all the places where uh, the machine learning researchers or the, you know, classical AI people, more logic rules and symbols people make direct reference to philosophers. You know, the, the Russell and Norvig textbook, which is, you know, as close to we have as like a Bible and AI, you go in the first chapter and five pages yeah. in, they're talking about Aristotle, you know, and they say like, you know, er, this is basically an algorithm that you can read out of Aristotle and code in, you know, uh, one of your programming languages and, and build a little rational agent model. Uh, and, you know, in the AlphaGo paper, you know, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but probably everybody has already heard about AlphaGo. Uh, the first sentence of the abstract, you know, they're saying we do this with a tabula, or alpha zero, I guess it was. We do this with a tabula rasa algorithm, right? That's a direct reference to, you know, not just Locke, but the whole empiricist tradition back to, to Aristotle. And if you look at the skeptics, you know, Gary Marcus loves to uh, invoke the empiricist rationalist debate and, and frequently invokes Locke. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think the most charitable interpretation of Locke, but... Uh, mm -hmm is always pointing to, you know, this is just the kind of continuation of what Locke was doing or when Judea Pearl is, is talking about the need to build causal models into his 
into uh, computational systems, you know, he's, he's saying this is the, the machine learning radical empiricist perspective that he reads out of machine learning today is kind of a continuation of Humean skepticism about causality. So I think it's already there all over the place in the computer science. Uh, you know, your point is taken that, you know, going from those quick references to the original source materials and then <laughs> trying to charitably interpret what those authors were really trying to say is where I think some of the speed bumps come in. But, uh, you know, that's one of the things I try to do with my own work is point to some of the secondary literature that I think is interpreting that uh, original source material in the most useful way to connect it up to uh, the current uh, challenges in machine learning. So I hope I hope that helps a bit. <laughs> You're one of the first um, of a kind of a hand well of a handful of philosophically minded. I, I don't want to just pin you as a philosopher because you're more than that. So, you know, I was almost, I was about to call you a philosopher. You're one of the worst, one of the first philosophers. You're more than that. But anyway, I have a handful of people who are connecting the modern AI and, and lessons that we're learning from modern AI to like a rich philosophical tradition, like em empiricism, um, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about. Um, and, and, and you often say, you know, it's surprising that more philosophers haven't started grappling with the progress in AI and, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. ideas and technologies that are coming out. How yeah. do you think AI is, is shaping or affecting, you know, modern philosophy of mind, just in a um, grand, you know, high level view? Is it, is it changing things? Or, because a lot of what you do is say, look, here's this... Uh, an autoencoder, and this is how, oh, I forget at, at the moment, you know, this is how this ancient philosopher used to talk about these faculties uh, that, mm -hmm. that, you know, we have mentally, and, and you connect those two. But is mm -hmm. AI, sh you know, transforming philosophy at all as well? I mean, that's, that's my hope. Um, I mean, it's, it's in one sense, it's, it's changing things. In another sense, a, a lot of the big pieces are staying the same. But one way that I think that it can uh, influence the debate in philosophy for the better is in empiricist philosophy of mind, for example, there's a number of places where uh, Locke or Hume or some, you know, William James, somebody says, well, the mind can do this thing. And it's, it's vitally important to my story about how we learn abstractions from experience or, or make rational inferences on an empiricist framework that the mind be able to do this thing. And I haven't the slightest idea how it does it, <laughs> right? You know, Hume, Hume in particular is, is sort of admirable in his modesty here, where again and again, he'll say, you know, he'll give you the evidence. He, 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 it's, it's sort of like he's laying out a kind of empirical case on, on the borders that, look, we do this, we do this, we do this. So clearly the mind can do this type of operation, but I don't have any idea how, and he even despairs that we'll ever be able to uh, explain certain things, like the faculty of imagination, for example, as a prime. Uh, place where Hume says, you know, the mind can compose novel concepts and dream up these fantastical situations that we've never seen in the past. And I just despair that we'll ever be able to understand how it does it. And his rationalist critics have repeatedly just savaged him <laughs> uh, on, on these points, you know, saying like, it looks like he's just, he's just assuming some solution to a problem to, to pl plug a hole in his view uh, without really having any way to explain it, and they diagnose a deeper problem there. So one of the places where I think the, the recent machine learning can really inform the philosophical debate is by filling in some of these ellipses, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of this whiff of magic uh, to some of these key appeals that the empiricists have made in the past, and showing how a you know, vaguely brain-inspired computational mechanism could actually do some of these operations. And I think that that's the sense of wonder that a lot of people get when they look at the recent products of like uh, DALI 2, for example. You know, if you've been on Twitter anywhere, you can't get away from this stuff, where you just give it a simple prompt and there's no way it saw anything exactly like that prompt in its training set. And it can paint you this beautiful picture of what that would look like, you know, and it's, it's the same sort of uh, fantastical uh, imagery that Hume was talking about in the treatise. And the difference is, you know, we can scrut we now have a computa computational mechanism that we can scrutinize and try to understand how it works. Uh, 
we're still not completely there yet. And that's one of the places where I think, you know, philosophy can then in turn uh, provide some guidance back to uh, machine learning and helping you know, figure out what are the right types of questions and what are the what are the kinds of understanding that we want to have about how Dolly 2, for example, is able to fuse, you know, a relatively scant text prompt using its latent space representations and then craft a, such beautiful output that seems so immediately uh, coherent and plausible to us. How is it able to do that? And what kind of understanding do we want to have of systems like that? Because they're vastly complicated, you know, billions and billions of parameters, and huge training sets. Uh, that's one place where I hope that philosophy can then come back and suggest some ideas about what questions we should ask of these systems and what types of understanding we should hope to have of them and, and how it all fits together in a more coherent picture of how the rational mind might work, you know, instead of just trying to solve some little marketable uh, trick, uh, you know, one particular task for uh, the next benchmark or uh, publication in the next machine learning conference, you know, what, what does this really add up to uh, together with everything else that uh, we've learned recently in machine learning uh, about how human minds work or animal minds work? You know, how, do, how does it add up to a bigger picture? I think that's a question that often uh, machine learning engineers don't, don't get enough time to ask um, themselves. Is Dolly too going to be the artist for your cover art on your book when it comes out? I mean, we'll see. There, we've got to figure out the copyright issues for uh, right. for the the results produced by Dolly too. But yeah, I mean, there's some open access ones. I've already I, I had long ago had one that I made myself in some of the earlier versions of uh, Taming Transformers or whatever that I really liked, and I've had some people make some mock up art for me in Dolly too. <laughs> That what remains is, is between uh, negotiation between me, the publishers, and uh, and OpenAI. Well, so I, I wanted to ask you, but you know, a lot of your early work focused on convolutional neural networks, which heralded in the deep learning revolution, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you talk about something called transformational abstraction, which I'll ask you about in, in just a second. You know, but now, and then you just mentioned transformers, and now we have transformers, uh, mm -hmm. and then next year. We'll probably have something else that'll be the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the model du jour. As a as a philosopher, is it hard to just keep up with the the pace of progress in AI? Because it takes you have to sit and I know it's uh, in philosophy you have to kind of swim in the waters mm -hmm. and then you have to think back to mm -hmm. who's relevant and what issues were right. relevant. But then a new model comes out and and you know for like CNNs, right? right? <laughs> How do they do what they do? What does it mean? And then now, no, you know, not that yeah. no one's using CNNs, obviously, but now it's all transformers. Yeah. And right. it'll, next year will be, is that frustrating or is it? Uh, I mean, uh, when you're form? trying to finish a book, it's certainly frustrating. <laughs> um, I've, I've been rapidly updating, you know, all the chapters with the, 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 the past six months have been uh, pretty breakneck. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to keep up when it's also fascinating uh, and exciting. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to try to read 10 papers a day when uh, they're all potentially interesting. I mean, I do as a philosopher, and I, I still have a lot of friends in computer science, and there's no way I could do this without uh, talking to them on a regular basis. So they provide me with a lot of help. Uh, it's harder for me, you know, for example, to sort hype from uh, genuine advances, because I, I would have to read a lot more carefully, uh, go, go through the methods section to see what's really going on. So, so getting some, some pointers from my friends that are still in computer science helps a lot, but, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's really a joy for me. It's, it's also the reason why I worked in animal cognition as opposed to other areas of uh, cognitive science or philosophy, because I just, I, it's, it's what keeps me going as an academic is working in areas where it feels to me like fundamental philosophical issues could really be empirically, uh, arbitrated on a, on a almost weekly basis with, the uh, new findings that are coming out in a way that you don't have any, you know, like fundamental metaphysics or basic epistemology. I don't want to knock any specific areas of philosophy, but, you know. Come on, go ahead, go for it. <laughs> no. it, it keeps me excited anyway and able to keep uh, turning on the computer and looking at the cursor every day. All right. But then, yeah, you, you must be thinking about your next book project already or, you know, like, oh, yeah. as well, because right? <laughs> you're trying to, trying to finish that sucker. Okay, yeah. well, uh, so... One of the things that you, um, that I guess we're going to talk a lot about, um, that you have pointed to is this, 
long-standing and continued dichotomy between empiricism and rationalism. And right. we'll talk about how you um, sort of dispel of that dichotomy or uh, pick a winner, I suppose. But mm -hmm. could you just, um, for people who aren't familiar, uh, can you just explain the dichotomy between empiricism and rationalism traditionally and then you know, how it continues to be a, a, mm -hmm. a subject of much debate these days? Yeah, I mean, as as you frame the question, like I'm sure you know that it's a, it's very difficult even to define those two terms and and outline the scope of the debate, and it's in large part because there's been, you know, at least four or five major incarnations of this debate over history. You know, you could you could index it to Plato versus Aristotle, you could index it to Locke and Hume versus Descartes and Leibniz, you could index it to you know William James versus some of the early introspective introspectionist psychologists. You could index it to the Vienna Circle versus the rest of philosophy. You could index it to you know rationalists in uh, epistemology theory of knowledge today. So you have to pick what you think is the the most important underlying threat. The way I typically start is it's a debate over the origins of human knowledge where you, you know, the first blush is you say the rationalists want to kind of unpack our innate mental endowment. And the empiricists think that most knowledge comes from sort of interpreting the cipher of experience, right? So the question is, where is, where is kind of like the structure from which human knowledge is built to be found? Is it, is it somehow latent within our minds or is it uh, out there in the world uh, for us to kind of uncover? You know, that works pretty well. But then, of course, you can you can interpret that in the, the half dozen different more specific debates that, that come to uh, quite different uh, things when when the rubber meets the road. Uh, in the particular incarnation that we have in AI today, I think you wouldn't do too badly by mapping rationalist nativism to uh, sort of classical AI or at least hybrid AI, where you think you need at least some rules and symbols to be manually encoded from the beginning uh, before you know genuinely human-like learning can take place. Whereas the empiricist side wants to either you know minimize or completely do away with any manual uh, pre-specification of knowledge structures uh, before learning begins. So the way I try to to transmute it into a useful debate today is to say that the empiricist is trying to derive all that domain specific abstraction. So that could be things like, you know, shapes or numbers or causal relations or uh, biological categories or kinship or, you know, whatever, all the things that some people think might be innate, uh, rationalists think might be innate in the mind. And the rationalist thinks, no, you need to build at least some of that structure in manually from the beginning. Uh, maybe like an intuitive theory of causality or an intuitive theory of uh, what objects are, or maybe even some beefier like evolutionary uh, psychology inspired stuff like kin detection or facial recognition or so on. You think you need some sort of manual pre-wiring of knowledge like structures. A, the core knowledge uh, domains right. of Liz Spelke. Yeah, so, so core knowledge, uh, Kerry and Spelke is sort of like the most popular uh, and it's really, that's kind of a really minimal uh, rationalist nativism in historical context. You know, so if you look at, you know, Jerry Fodor in Philosophy and Cogsight 30 years ago or 40 years ago, or you look at uh, the middle incarnations of Chomsky and linguistics, you know, you're, you know, Fodor notoriously says like every single simple concept in the mind is, is innate. Okay, he means something kind of specific by that. Or Chomsky thinks, you know, you have uh, hundreds of rules and parameters that are innately specified in the universal grammar that then get sort of tuned to your particular language. Uh, core knowledge wants just, you know, a few pretty general concepts uh, to be innately pre-specified, like object and agent and uh, number. So, I, you know, the way I interpret the history, sort of like the empiricists have already mostly won the field that we've negotiated the nativists down from sort of platonic or Fedorian uh, <laughs> multitudes to just a handful. And I, I still think, I still think that uh, that debate is really worth having and empirically very fascinating to arbitrate and really worth getting into uh, the details of the experiments that are done in 
developmental psychology are also, um, you know, the, the way that I recommend machine learning researchers kind of enter into the debate is it's, it's sort of like a contest where we can transmute this philosophical question that goes all the way back to Plato and Aristotle into kind of an empirical contest, right? Where you just build some systems according to the rationalist principles, maybe hybrid systems of the sort that like Gary Marcus recommends. And you build some systems according to empiricist principles uh, of the sort that, you know, like Bengio or Lacoon recommend, and you just see which ones are more successful or human-like. But, and this is like the fundamental reason I wanted to write this book, I think that the, the rationalists are uh, misinterpreting what the empiricists should be allowed to uh, build right. into their systems from the beginning. And I think that you know, to understand how this uh, mischaracterization started, you know, I think you have to go back to the beginning of cognitive science, um, which has been an interdisciplinary field with a bit of an identity crisis you know, since the beginning. So anytime you, you try to bring, you know, uh, computer science and philosophy and linguistics and biology and all these different fields together, uh, you're always going to face this question, like, what are we doing such that we should all be talking to each other and trying to uh, be engaged in this common intellectual endeavor all the time? And you always get this bedtime story about uh, Chomsky's uh, review of Skinner's verbal behavior, right, and how... Uh, the reason we needed the cognitive revolution was that uh, behaviorism, uh, which was, you know, empiricism and associationism and all the stuff that, you know, at least by label I champion now, uh, was so terribly wrong and limiting and so on that we needed to uh, just completely break with it and have a paradigm shift uh, away to a new way of thinking. And then the rationalists today, like Gary Marcus, you know, he does this and Steven Pinker does this and Jerry Fodor loves doing this. And, you know, all the, all the critics of deep learning uh, almost love to uh, then paint uh, deep learning as being the contemporary reincarnation of psychological behaviorism. And this is just totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so w w what I really try to do in the book is articulate exactly why that's not the, the, the way to set up this contest. I think it's absolute this, this contest between the empiricist bots and the rationalist bots is exactly the contest we should be having today. But it is absolutely not the reincarnation of, you know, B.F. Skinner or uh, Watson uh, versus Noam Chomsky in the 60s. Um, you know, and, and what they want to say is it's, it's just, you know, statistics, pattern matching, simple association on sort of computational steroids, right? It's just a couple of simple principles of association like classical and operant conditioning. And then you juice it up with huge data sets and huge massive amounts of computation. And that's all deep learning is. And what I try to do in the book is go through uh, dozens and dozens or hundreds of models and show how they all do something substantially more than that. Hmm. And in fact, what they do is exactly the kinds of things that what Locke or Hume or uh, William James or Ibn Sina, I talk about Sophie de Grouchy, Adam Smith, all these other empiricists had these wonderful ideas where they had similar ellipses like the one that Hume had with the imagination. And you can see how the structure that's built into these deep learning models is really quite similar to the more ambitious ideas that they had that go beyond uh, simple operant and classical conditioning that was in the behaviorist toolkit. So the question, you know, then becomes, okay, so what are the constraints on what the empiricists can appeal to? Um, and I think you, you know, there, there've been some rationalist nativist philosophers in particular, Lawrence and Margolis, who've written some nice papers about this, who've, who similarly complained from the nativist side about setting up the terms of the debate in this way, because there just isn't anybody who's an empiricist and maybe there never was. Right. Um, if the only innate mechanisms you're allowed to appeal to in your attempt to explain how the mind works are operant and classical conditioning, then, you know, not even the classical behaviorists believe that because they even they needed, you know, uh, uh, attention and they needed basic drives and they needed all kinds of other innate stuff that was relevant to get uh, behaviorist learning off the ground. Um, Locke and Hume and the others and deep learning today also appealed to uh, a variety of other domain general procedures that I canvas under the term of faculties, like memory and attention and imagination 
And uh, there's just no way to make sense of what they were trying to do without granting them these appeals to the faculties that they make in their works. What, what, and what so, is a, a, a faculty, though? What it, like, Because um, I'm, I'm grappling with this term, whether a faculty is a potential or it is the, you know, because you could set up a system so that it has some inductive bias. Would you call that a faculty? Or, you know, like what, how big is the umbrella of faculty? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, it's a, it's a good question. It's a question on which a lot turns and which has uh, been arbitrated differently, let's say, throughout the century. So the, uh, let's at least the interpreters of Aristotle. So Aristotle was a faculty psychologist, right? He had the same standard set of faculties that we do, you know, perception, attention, memory, imagination, and so on. So this is, this is something that's very deep in human thought. Um, and the scholastics that were interpreting Aristotle, at least, they had a kind of dispositional or what we now call a uh, functional way of interpreting the factor faculties where they give it a kind of, they define it in time in terms of like a dispositional power to do a certain type of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then anytime you wanted to explain, you know, how is it that I form some mental imagery, you would just say, Oh, well, you have a faculty that has the power to do that. Right. This is, this is consistent with a kind of form of functional explanation that, uh, you know, got, got made fun of a lot in early modern philosophy, where you like explain why, why is it that opium makes you sleepy because of its dormitive properties, right? This was right. just another <laughs> example of that. And Locke makes almost that same argument against the scholastic approach to the faculties um, in his work. Hume, I think, takes a different approach. I think Locke does too, but Hume makes it even more explicit. And, you know, some of the secondary literature that uh, I was mentioning earlier that would be really useful for people to dig into here is by a guy named Thomas Demeter, Th Thomas Demeter, um, who's written a couple of articles rebutting Fodor's interpretation of Hume, in particular on the faculties, like the faculty of the imagination. And he suggests that, um, the way that Hume thinks about the faculties is not as some kind of dispositional definition where you just have this thing that has the power to do this. He treats it rather like a kind of empirical hypothesis where you want to define like sort of cluster of uh, effects. You know, so you say, look, the human mind can do this and it can do this and it can do this. These three or four things, they all seem kind of related to one another. So these are things like fusing together different concepts to make a novel concept like a unicorn you know is a horse with a horn coming out of his head or the ability to form mental imagery or the ability to gauge the relative probability of two events by forming uh images in your head about how those two things would those two scenarios would play out you might say these things all sort of seem to have something in common with, with one another um let's call the thing that does that the imagination now, I'm going to be absolutely explicit that I haven't explained how the imagination does that, but we do have something that can do those things. And they seem to roughly cohere together. And then I'll try to characterize what that faculty is like. And Hume says some things like it seeks novelty and it's, it seems to want to like complete pictures. You know, uh, he has this uh, a variety of things where he kind of sketches around the edges of what the imagination is like, but he never defines it. And he never says he's explaining how it works. That's where I think, you know, it's really interesting to plug in some of these more recent neural network architectures that can actually do some of these jobs, uh, like generative adversarial networks or generative transformers, and say, you know, look, here's a physical system that does not have any innate knowledge built into it of the sort that the rationalist said you would need to have. And it looks like it can do some of the jobs that Hume says the imagination could do. Now, I don't go so far as to say like, okay, so now we've created a system that has a real imagination, right? Mm. I approach it more from a standard kind of modeling perspective in philosophy of science to say, no, of course, this is a partial model of the imagination, uh, but maybe it's modeling some critical like difference making aspects of the mind or brain that allow us to do these things in our head. And in that sense, it can teach us uh, some of the key bits that, that Hume, you know, based on the neuroscience or mathematics of his day, he couldn't possibly explain. It can fill in some of those critical ellipses that then strengthens the whole empiricist package when they try to explain rational cognition. So, you know, I, I prefer to, you know, one of the ways that Tomas Demeter puts it is that um, 
it's it's all hume is often interpreted as as wanting to be like the newton of the mind in other words trying to do a kind of physics of the mind where you have these ideas that are bouncing off against one another like billiard balls um and kind of affecting one another like physical particles and he says no that's not quite right in fact hume makes a uh, a number of appeals in the treatise and the inquiry into other sciences, uh, more biological sciences like anatomy or more chemical sciences where the fusion of two things can be more than the sum of its parts. And Hume is better interpreted, you know, when talking about the faculties as doing the same type of thing that like an anatomist does when they try to theorize about, you know, how a liver works or how a heart works, where you, 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 ha you need to have something that does this job and you kind of sketch its position in a kind of architecture of other or mental organs. And then you can start trying to theorize about how it actually works. And from a kind of mechanistic perspective, from a variety of different perspectives, using behavioral work, maybe using modeling work, maybe in, in integrating some neuroscientific findings into the story. Um, and so I think that's the better way to, to approach the faculties in so these cases. You used, uh, is it faculty psychology, I think is the phrase. And, yeah. you know, some, something like imagination. Um, you know, there, there are people these days who think that our folk psychological concepts are mm -hmm. uh, incorrect or outdated mm -hmm. or n we need new terms because they don't map on to, you know, the quote-unquote mechanisms uh, in the brain. Yeah. In that, um, mm -hmm. so, so when you use a term like imagination, is that in the psychological domain and... And then we can look at mechanisms and keep them separate, or is this a way to fuse the psychology with, you know, a more uh, with the biological or computer uh, mechanistic uh, implementation level uh, mm -hmm. accounts, right, of, of of how these things play out? In right. other words, you know, right. are, are we fine just using a separate language for the mental psychological constructs that are these faculties? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, or can we fuse them? You know, is there? Can we bridge that divide in the, with this approach? Yeah. I I tend to be a mechanist in these types of disputes, but then some of the more subtle philosophy of modeling of the last ten years has been about abstract mechanistic explanations. You know, you've had Catherine Stinson on. That's that's one of the places where I draw on her work. Uh, also, Galtiero Piccinini and and a few others have been writing recently about how. Uh, mechanisms, you know, mechanistic un explanations for the brain don't have to be pitched at the most specific grain of detail. Mm. And they can be quite general. And faculties, you know, are, are almost as general as they get. A lot of my previous work has actually cast at an even higher level of abstraction at about cognition itself, you know. And so I wrote about what kind of mechanism could implement cognition. The faculties are a little bit more specific than that. But it's not like, you know, the imagination is going to map to a particular brain region. That's thinking uh, much too simplistically about the relationship between uh, computational models and how the brain works. I do think that we should try to draw as close a relationship as we can between the architecture and other structural details of these neural network models and the brain's operations. Uh, and, you know, all other things being equal, uh, a model that has a tighter mechanistic structural correspondence is to be preferred. But those tighter correspondences are often traded off against other things. So, you know, for example, this is a problem that, you know, fMRI people forget about the computational models, but th my brain differs from your brain, right? So, right. you know, if I'm trying yeah. to interpret fMRI, there's going to be some slight differences even between where certain uh, functional capacities are localized in the correlates between my brain and your brain. So, you know, even just thinking about humans, not even going to other species or to artificial uh, agents, you can't go too specific. I do think that there's a nice story that can be told at this point about the deep convolutional neural networks. And I try to do that in my synthesis article to say that these might actually be, uh, you know, we might have actually located, let's put it, the generic mechanism in Stinson's terms, if anybody wants to go back and listen to that um, podcast too, uh, that is shared between a deep convolutional neural network that's instantiated in a computer and uh, the ventral stream processing in the primate brain. 
Uh, so this is a story that like James DiCarlo uh, and his lab have told in a number of different publications where the idea is that, uh, you know, going all the way back to Hubel and Wiesel, you have this alternation in the ventral stream between what they call simple cells and complex cells, right? Where they say the simple cells are responding to a particular feature in a particular orientation. And then the complex cells take uh, input from multiple simple cells that are detecting the same feature, but in slightly different orientations or maybe in a slightly different location. Uh, and they fire just if one of their inputs fires above a certain threshold, let's say, right? So the simple cells have what you know we call an, a linear activation pattern and the complex cells have what we call a nonlinear activation pattern. And then the theory is that there's lots of kind of layering of these simple and complex cells uh, throughout the ventral stream. And this is, in fact, the, the neuroscientific hypothesis that inspired some of the very first deep convolutional neural networks all the way back in Fukushima in the 80s, right? He was directly inspired by this neuroscientific work. The neocognitron, um, yeah. Right, neocognitron, which, you know, didn't get as much attention maybe as it should have back in the day because we didn't really know how to train such networks effectively. Yeah. But the, the basic insights of the deep convolutional neural network were, were largely there. Um, and the thought is, so what you're looking for is a kind of a, an abstract kind of mechanism that could be instantiated in very different types of substrates, but that captures the sort of key difference makers that allow a cognitive system to solve a certain type of cognitive problem, like object recognition, for example. And the way the story goes, right, is that by... Uh, passing the input from many of these linear feature detectors to a nonlinear aggregator and then stacking lots of those sandwiches of linear and nonlinear um, detectors on top of one another in a deep hierarchy, you sort of iteratively make the detection of objects more and more resistant to what the machine learning researchers and vision researchers call nuisance variation, right? which is what makes object detecting hard and really is what made all the classical good old fashioned AI computer vision models fail because you, you just, there's just too much nuisance variation in the input that you can't explicitly anticipate it all and program for it all using manual rules and symbols. So the, the computational benefits that you get from one of these deep linear nonlinear stacked hierarchies, and the ability to train them gradually over time is what allows the thought goes both the brain and deep convolutional neural networks like AlexNet and later inheritors to solve these uh, visual recognition problems so much more effectively than all previous methods. And the, to me, that's a mechanistic explanation. It's just a very abstract one, right? And it's one that's at a level of abstraction that could be shared between humans and monkeys and artificial neural networks in a variety, you know, built in a variety of different substrates. And, and that's the sweet stuff, right? That's, that's the sweet spot that you want between making specific empirical predictions, but also being simple and abstract enough that you feel like you're really understanding some kinds of deep principles about how this works. But in the, in the case of um, Jim DiCarlo and Dan Yeamans and now many others, work on using CNNs to model the visual ventral visual stream, you know, they, they sort of limited the model to try to map it on as well as they could to the various hierarchical levels in the brain. And, and mm -hmm. now there's like, I think it's called brain score, where you can right. see how much variance your model um, explains with respect to neural activity that's recorded. But then, of course, the, uh, the size of convolutional neural networks has just grown and grown and grown mm -hmm. to where it's, mm -hmm. you know, n not not that it really resembles brains ever, <laughs> but so it's less, so it less resembles brains. Mm -hmm. um, and thinking about like, uh, I don't know if we've used the, the word, the phrase domain general faculty yet, but that's what you were alluding mm -hmm. to earlier is these domain general faculties that kind of fit um, right. these various things in them. You know, when you have a giant convolutional neural network, let's say, I guess what I want to ask is, you know, would that still just be the same faculty at a larger scale because it's doing something superhuman or would you potentially be building new faculties as you scale up for instance does that make sense 
Yeah, gosh, I mean, that's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about entirely new faculties yet. Um, I'm, I'm already sort of committed to the idea that um, large enough differences in sort of computational scale or power can add up to qualitatively different psychological functioning. Because I think that's really part of the case that I make about like what's different between uh, contemporary deep convolutional neural networks and the simple three layer networks that you had back in the 80s and 90s is, you know, th this is a result that's been proven a number of ways in the computer sciences. You get exponential benefits in uh, computational power by having a much deeper network because you can recursively reuse some computation that's performed by an earlier node uh, relative right. to the depth of the network. Uh, so you can now solve some, you know, you can say like, well, in principle, you know, a three layer neural network could approximate any function. Yeah, sure. If you had like, you know, computation for billions of years and you had the number of processors that there are atoms in the universe, it's not really worth talking about. But now we actually have physical mechanisms that can actually do these problems. Okay, maybe a lot of them require data sets that might be a bit larger than the ones that say a human child's been exposed to. That's actually a point that I you know, think is worth a lot of uh, interpretive work as well. Um, but they can do it, you know, in a practical time period in a way that uh, some of the earlier networks can. And that's a direct result of them having this kind of generic uh, mechanism that, that we were talking about just a second ago. Um, I, you're right that the one that, say, DiCarlo's lab built was kind of constrained to be shallower and m maybe more biologically plausible in its size than a lot of the ones that people are using for state-of-the-art applications today. Uh, and I think there are very interesting and deep philosophical questions. This is one of the questions I raise in my Nature Machine Intelligence paper about the problems of induction is, is more directed at the possibility that these systems are discovering real features that are kind of like be necessarily beyond human ken, right? That, yeah. you know, so I, I think this is kind of vividly raised by uh, AlphaFold and AlphaFold2. Right. 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 Where you say there are these microbiologists who've devoted their lives to predicting protein folds. And then, yeah. you know, on its first shot on the task, yeah. alpha fold just blows them out of the water. Uh, How yeah. does it do that? And you can talk about, you know, the Leventhal paradox and the complexity of an amino acid chain and how many different possible uh, degrees of freedom there are for it to fold and say, like, there's just no way that it could see some features that are letting it make these, but what if it can? <laughs> like, you know, what if, what if that system looks at this very complex and, and just because it's so much larger uh, in, its, in its deep hierarchy, let's say, than brains plausibly could be, that it, it sees some feature there. And that feature has like, let's say, all of the nice properties of being robust uh, to differences in background conditions and, and being maybe even causally manipulable to, to bring about certain apps. Suppose it has all, you know, all the special properties or whatever you want of a, a real scientific property. What do we say in that case? You know, is, are there real properties out there that are necessarily beyond human intelligence? And is like the fun, the frontier of science now going to be defined by us relying on on machines to see properties that we sort of like necessarily can't understand. You know, that we, we rely on, you know, like the web telescope now to see things very distant way, but we can understand the properties that we're seeing. But what if, these might be properties that are just like necessarily beyond our, our comprehension. What, what, what should we do about that um, as, as scientists or philosophers of science? Oh, come on, um, entirely new faculties. I don't know. I don't, even, I don't even know how we would grapple with entirely new faculties. <laughs> You well, know, if, if say, there was some, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. New, new, new properties are bad enough from, from my perspective. <laughs> uh, but, but it could be, you know, that they just start, uh, out thinking us in some way that we, we can't even figure out the way in which they're out thinking us. And, and then we might really be in trouble. <laughs> well, I was going to say, come on, you're going to turn me level. into a singularity theorist. I'm not a singularity right. theorist, but you're going to turn me into one. Well, right. But I mean, so a lot of what you focus on, you know, thinking about these domain general faculties is. You know, one of the questions I was going to ask you is, well, how many do we need, right? Is it a handful? Yeah. Is it yeah. a bunch? Yeah. And but but that is geared very much toward human intelligence. Yeah. And yeah. we all know human yeah. intelligence is the highest well, intelligence ever in the universe. But well, that's 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 actually I, I the way I like to look at it for for both humans, and this is the way I kind of present it in the book. The way I like to look at it for both humans and machines 
is that the faculties are solutions to computational problems, right? So um, nuisance variation is a problem and perception is a faculty that's a solution to that problem. You talk then, you know, what does perception let you do? And then you do this thing I was talking about, thinking about the edge of a mental organ, like what is, what is its role in the cognitive economy? And then you start to theorize about the internal structure of that faculty. How does it do the job that it does? Um, imagination is a solution to a computational problem, right? You train up a deep convolutional neural network, but it has a hard time generalizing to out of distribution data, right? This is a just standard problem that all machine learning researchers worry about. You say like, that's great. But how is it going to create, you know, novel representations or deal with novel situations? You say, well, what if you had a generative system that could recombine its previous experience in flexible ways to think about, uh, you know, predict what would happen in different types of situations or what different types of combinations that weren't explicitly in its training set might look like? That's a solution to a computational problem. Memory is one of the best examples, right? There's a very classic paper by uh, McClellan, Rummelhart, and O'Reilly, right? About, um, or is it McClellan, McNaughton, and O'Reilly? I don't want to get the uh, citation. Yeah, yeah, the '95 paper, anyway, um, about Co catastrophic interference. Learning systems. Sorry, catastrophic right. so, learning. Uh, so ca complementary learning systems. I just want to say the phrase. That's right. The, catastrophic the interference or catastrophic forgetting. It sometimes gets called right, but there's this yeah. problem with all neural networks that. They have a tendency when you train them on a new problem, they tend to overwrite their previously learned adaptive solutions to other problems, especially if there's some kind of thematic overlap between the two subject materials. That's a fundamental computational problem with any system that learns the way that brains or, or artificial neural networks do, right? And memory is proposed as a solution to that problem by by having different memory systems one that has a faster learning rate and one that has a slower learning rate and doing kind of slow interleaved memory consolidation over longer periods of time you know so that's the way i look at all of the faculties in the book you know i could tell the same story about attention or about empathy and social cognition they're all solutions to computational problems that are going to be faced by both humans and by robots and if you look at it that way it's really not it's, you know, it's the same story. Um, and it, it, from my perspective, it really provides another form of confirmatory evidence that neural network type approaches to the mind are the right way to think about things, right? When you find that the brain has developed some kind of faculty or system, whatever you want to call it, that solves this computational problem that are uh, neural, artificial neural networks that lack this system uh, struggle with, that suggests that we're on, to me, we're, we're on, not only on the right track by modeling the mind's operations with artificial neural networks, but that we're also on the right track by trying to add more faculties and faculty-like processing to our deep neural network architectures. And I think this is really something that's already well underway. And I think it's a, it's a perspective that's certainly uh, very friendly and familiar to the way that deep mind works. Um, and a lot of other researchers that have come from psychology and neuroscience that are now in deep learning, I think, uh, share this type of perspective. So, I, I, you know, I think one of the things I do in the book, you know, so you, you start from this behaviorist caricature. It's all just classical and operant conditioning on computational steroids. And you can show, no, look, here's like five models from DeepMind or, or you know, some other modelers where they explicitly say we were inspired to add this thing to our architecture by the way that memory works in uh, mammalian brains to solve this specific computational problem. Or, you know, you can look at dozens of models that say, you know, look, we're adding an attentional mechanism to solve this problem. You know, the, the fundamental uh, innovation of transformers being a particular type of attention. We're adding this sort of to solve this very particular computational problem in a way that's, you know, vaguely inspired by the role that this faculty plays in this type of processing in human brains. And so, that's that that that's why I use the faculties as a kind of narrative thread to uh, try to uh, raise familiarity and awareness with a, a much wider range of neural network architectures than typically get invoked in these types of flashpoint debates. You have you don't have an exhaustive list of our of the needed domain general <laughs> faculties, but one one of the things that you appeal to is. Uh, in the days of old, which doesn't happen much anymore, and you, you kind of put a call out that this is what AI researchers sh should be focusing more on, and some are, are cognitive architectures. Uh, 
people like yeah, you know yeah, Chris Elias Smith, yeah. Randy O'Reilly, they're yeah. trying to you know build these things. Right. And and you do you think that the time is right now to start taking these modules and putting them together and then figuring right. out how they can work together right. to do more yeah right intelligent things. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, most of the, so there, I, I say in the book, there's been a lot of faculty models, but they've mostly been one-offs, right? So right. they, they just say like, we're adding a memory store to this model and look at what cool things it can do. Or we're adding some imagination like component, look at the cool stuff it can do. Or we're adding an attentional mechanism, look at the cool stuff it can do. But you don't yet see somebody trying to release a full deep learning cognitive architecture, the way that you've seen, as you mentioned with, uh, older, uh, previous incarnations of, um, Soar, cognitive architecture Actar. like Soria yeah. or Actar. Yeah. Those are the examples I talk about in the book. Um, and I think the time is definitely right for that, but this is another place where I think it would be really good to look at the history of empiricist philosophy. Uh, and this is not, you know, a novel idea I came up with, but the thought is that as they try to combine more and more semi-independent modules in a coherent deep learning cognitive architecture, they're going to face more control problems and coordination problems, right? where you know the memory module and the imagination module might conflict or the attention module might uh, have multiple things sort of vying for its uh, its its processing and, and these are problems that I think it would be best to be proactive about um, at this point where we're just now starting to build you know fully deep learning cognitive architecture that's not sort of hybrid but really like deep learning through and through are how how are we going to solve these control and coordination problems before they they really become unmanageable and this is this type of problem is something that all of the empiricist philosophers worried about sort of exhaustively in their mm -hmm. famous works is they worried endlessly about confusing the deliverances of perception and imagination and memory and they had kind of detailed almost processing level stories about how they thought you should solve that problem in terms of like saliency and vibrancy different, different um, properties of the mental representation that they don't give you an algorithm exactly, but, you know, they give you really rich ideas. Um, you know, I, I was mentioning I was just in Scotland. The, the, the way I think that I'd like um, these, the neural network modelers to read the philosophy is sort of the way that like a Scottish landscape painter would go to, you know, the highlands to sort of take in the scenery and, and sort of get inspired, right? You get the big picture. It's not going to tell you how to do the code in the same way that like looking at the beautiful view doesn't tell you how to paint the picture, but it's sort of like, it's, it gives you some ideas about what to try to paint and, and why it's valuable to try to paint that thing. Right. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that reading, you know, what, you know, Hume or Locke had to say about these control problems where the faculties might clash with one another would provide that kind of inspiration to develop the algorithms that might actually solve the problems in computational mechanisms. I mean, do you think that that's going to be one of the harder, do you think that's going to be harder than what's being done in deep learning these days, like the, the control and coordination between modules? You know, there are even, you know, trade-offs between model-based and model-free reinforcement learning in our brain. And right, there's work right. done to see which right. one takes over and are they in right. competition? Or are they complementary? And, right. and that's just within a very narrow domain, right? So then you have these other mm -hmm. somewhat distinct domain general faculties that then need to coordinate. Uh, it seems like a different problem, but I don't know that it is than, you know, learning weights. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so there's, that's, that's certainly one of the ways that I think it's definitely worth approaching the solution to the problem is to think of it as just another kind of meta reinforcement learning problem or whatever, where, uh, you have, you know, this is the way that like Matthew Botman likes to think about it. For example, is you've, you've just got sort of another, reinforcement learning system that's doing something like executive control and you you just train it to kind of select between different policies and the different sub networks uh, and you don't have uh, you know at least i haven't seen a model quite yet where they're they're working that type of approach to you know arbitrate between like memory storage and visual imagery from an imagination module or generating internal monologue from a verbal transformer but that's that's like the kind of work i would like to see try mm. and maybe it maybe it's just another reinforcement learning problem i don't know mm -hmm. um but maybe it's not right maybe you, maybe you need to think about some other dimensions of the problem that are you know described by some of the empiricist philosophers sorry to ask you a very specific question because i know you don't have a uh, an exhaustive list of domain uh general faculties but 
and you mentioned empathy, um, and that's, mm -hmm. you know, that we think of that as like a really higher cognitive capacity or faculty mm -hmm. and, and social, um, is language its, its own domain general faculty? Where does, where does language fit? Or is it part of a social? I think, you have a, go yeah, ahead. just for narrative structure in the book, I treat it as, as part of attention, um, oh, okay. as being well, transformers. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, the thought being, you know, and that's based a little bit also on my on a lot of my background reading into, you know, people who treat language like a faculty. How is it that they think that it works? You know, what is it? the Let's say approach it from the perspective. What's the uniquely human uh, right. capacity for language that's not shared with, you know, like Nim Chimsky or, or some of the animals that they've tried to teach language to? And the thought is, well, only we can learn grammatical uh, structures in terms of like recursive tree building syntactic structures uh, somewhere in a particular place in the Chomsky and hierarchy. Right. Um, and a lot of people think like sort of maybe what we have in, you know, our left temporal areas or whatever that get associated with grammatical processing is a kind of uh, a pointer system that lets us kind of like store locations in a grammatical structure as the structure gets kind of elaborated to be more and more complex so that we can process particular bits of that structure uh, recursively in the right order. You can understand that as a kind of attentional mechanism, right? Maybe combined with a kind of memory mechanism, right? Where the attentional mechanism is pointing to where you need to look in the hierarchy and then um, helping you. So it could just be a particularly sophisticated form of attentional mechanism. I don't think the debates about how exactly to count faculties are really quite as important as saying there need to be, you know, what what's the real debate to be had between the rationalist nativist today and the empiricist is whether the empiricist should get to appeal to a bunch of other domain general innate structure that does more than just a couple simple learning rules. And the answer to that is obviously yes. The rest of the debates about how many faculties there should be and, and which faculties uh, there are and which ones are actually distinct from other ones is I think a, a family dispute that's totally worth, you know, empirically arbitrating. You know, another really interesting example where that dispute comes up is whether uh, memory and imagination are distinct. And that right. debate actually has a very long philosophical pedigree too, you know, going all the way back to Hobbes and Hume and a number of other philosophers who weighed in as to whether uh, imagination and memory are or not distinct. And Felipe de Brigard and uh, a number of other philosophers uh, recently have, have weighed in on that. Uh, you know, the thought being that because we find that memory recall seems to be a little bit more creative and reconstructive than the kind of photocopy uh, replay picture of memory suggested, uh, you might think, well, uh, memory is just a particular mode of the imagination or something like that. Uh, you know, I, I have kind of a particular take on that where I think it's actually worth preserving the ends of the continuum, but then there might be some interesting middle positions. You know, so uh, the psychologist Nicer talked about this category of what he called reposodic memory, which is uh, like, you know, I don't know if your family celebrates Thanksgiving, uh, mm -hmm. but you might have a memory of like a typical Thanksgiving dinner, you know, or some other holiday, whatever holiday your family celebrates, right? Where it's not like it was a particular event the way that episodic memory is supposed to be. But it's kind of like slightly abstracted. It might be an amalgamation of like 10 Thanksgiving dinners, you know, yeah, where you yeah. know, somebody's got the game on and somebody's complaining about the turkey. And, right, you know, these certain things happen kind of stereotypically. It's somewhere in between, you know, a kind of creatively, fully abstracted event and a particular record of a particular occasion. And I think there's going to be lots of examples that are kind of like blends, you know, a mental representation is kind of a blend or cooperation between diff two different faculties. But that doesn't mean that like my memory of what I had for breakfast this morning or what I did five minutes ago is like a purely imaginative act. And there's no difference between, you know, me recalling what I had for breakfast and uh, me imagining what it would be like to, you know, ride a unicorn on the rooftop over there. Those are, those are still pretty distinct modes of uh, my mind. And I think that's how a lot of these uh, disputes about exactly how to count the faculties and uh, exactly what the borders of the faculties are going to be should should work is where you have sort of like particular models of how each individual faculty, when, it, when it's kind of like in its purest mode, 
is operating. And then you can understand a lot of the penumbral cases as being uh, kind of halfway in between or involving cooperation or coordination between the faculties. We, we do celebrate Thanksgiving, but um, it's the, exactly the same every year. We sit around, we're all uh, just <laughs> talking about how much we love each other and just super thankful the whole time. And dinner always comes out perfectly. So uh, nobody they, complains about the turkey. No one complains about the turkey. But so, so you know, memory, imagination, dichotomy, right? Um, empiricism, rationalism, dichotomy. I, I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you this, and I, I'm a, I almost skipped over it, is just how to go beyond dichotomous thinking. I mean, I think that we, yeah. maybe one of our domain general faculties is dichotomous thinking, right? Yeah, for <laughs> sure. To, to put, uh, to, you know, have binary uh, A versus B. But it seems that historically, and, and, you know, like what you're doing with domain general faculties, for instance, seems to dissolve some of the that dichotomy yeah. Um, and, and seems fruitful. Is there a methodological approach uh, that you take to dissolve dichotomies or is, is it just swimming in the waters of each of them and trying to understand what each camp is trying to say and what they're really saying and, and so on? I mean, it's it's I think just sort of really taking the time to charitably uh, interpret what each author thinks some of these big banner terms imply. And kind of mapping them out on a on a conceptual map you know it doesn't have to be like a single dimension continuum sometimes you might need right. even two or three dimensions but you know i think i have a couple of figures like that in my book where i try to say you know look you know sure these are all rationalists in some sense but that just means they're kind of on one side of this long continuum and, and there are important inter-party differences that are relevant to uh, the dispute with the, the other far side of the continuum in the sense where you want to say like core knowledge is much more empiricist than uh, Fodor or mid-career mid Chomsky or Plato is in a, in a totally meaningful sense. And, the, you know, like uh, Lacoon might be less empiricist than, you know, certain like bitter lesson, hardcore, just throw more computation at it, um, uh, machine learning theorists. And, and these are these are important differences that you want to recognize to avoid the kind of caricaturing and talking past that um, I'm trying to urge everybody to stop for us to have a kind of the most useful competition that we can have in this, this grand engineering moment that we have. But you use the word charity there. And I, I think that charity is not used as often as it could be <laughs> in these debates. Right. I mean, I, I think it's actually quite important to give a, a charitous a, as most, uh, a most charity laden interpretation as possible. But like you said, you know, when someone, you know, like Gary Marcus or, or someone comes in and, and goes straight to the, to the old debates, right. It's, it's a less charitable mm -hmm. interpretation. And I, I don't know if we just have a tendency to do that because it's the thing that's going to support our arguments the most or, um, or if it's more nefarious, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, subtlety yeah. is hard and, and the, yeah. Yeah. the, the mantras, I mean, I talk about this in the book, the mantras that you get from Locke and Hume, because the language is, is different. Um, yeah. they look pretty straightforward in everyday English today, but you have to actually read much deeper into the book to see what they really mean by it. I mean, I, I do, I do think that at least in some philosophy PhD programs, charitable interpretation these days, at least, is, is very heavily emphasized, you know, or at least the, the people who raised me uh, in my PhD program, you know, Jonathan Weinberg was one of my teachers, and he just emphasized, like, you, before you're allowed to criticize somebody's view, you have to defend it better than they explained it themselves. Right, right. Right. And I, I have very That's vivid hard. memories from my philosophy PhD, where one of my first publications was a BBS commentary. And I went through sort of 16 drafts of that BBS commentary and sending it back to Jonathan. And he would say, you know, no, you know, <laughs> Carruthers doesn't actually think that. Read that, read here. And then, uh, okay, oh, boy. where does he say that? Uh, does he actually explicitly say this? Or are there, here's five other ways to interpret the thing that he does say. Try again, you know. And I think everybody should try to go through that activity before they, um, they try to tack specific, uh, especially uh, ridiculous views on, on smart people. Yeah. Uh, and it would, it, everything would be better if everybody tried to do that. But I mean, and not everybody can write, you know, a philosophy monograph on how to no. subtly understand <laughs> uh, empiricist versus rationalist thinking. And, and it's one of the hardest ones because it has so much philosophical baggage from so many different incarnations. I mean, I'm still struggling with this based from comments that I get from people, you know, because if somebody, 
if somebody comes from being raised, you know, on the Vienna Circle, Carnap, and you know, versus Quine, uh, th that's a you know, this is logical positivism where you're supposed to not be able to. What empiricists meant in that case was um, every term had to be explicitly defined in terms of sensory observations that would make it true. And that's just a totally different conception of what the empiricist rationalist debate is uh, from, you know, the one that Locke and Hume were fighting or the one that Plato and Aristotle were fighting or the one that we're fighting today. And you, you just have to be really careful that you're not importing some um some assumptions about what those terms meant, especially in these interdisciplinary areas like cognitive science from uh, your previous background, because these terms get used everywhere. You know, it, it could happen somebody interpreting them from linguistics being raised on, you know, Chomsky versus the, the anti-generativists or, uh, you know, uh, in developmental psychology, the nativists versus the empiricists there. And they all mean slightly different things. So you always have to be careful, especially when you're porting uh, to a different discipline that, uh, it means exactly the same thing there. You feel like you're, uh, do you feel satisfied that you're, uh, towing that line? Okay. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm never entirely satisfied. <laughs> okay. No, no, I'm never entirely satisfied. I mean, if, if you're asking me what I revise most frequently in the book, it's the first Ooh. chapter where I try to define exactly what, uh, uh what empiricism and rationalism mean. And I've got a whole subsection where, I say, here's, here's eight other things it could mean. And it sort of means these three things in this book. And it definitely doesn't mean these four other things in this book. And, and just to, just to lay it all out there and try to make sure that we're all on the same page. It's a great question. I should have asked you and I'll probably ask future guests. What do you revise the most? <laughs> it's kind of telling. Yeah. But before we, you know, if you have time, I want to uh, get on to talk about forward looking content and teleo semantics, but before we yeah. leave domain general faculties, um, I, I want to ask about, I guess two things, you know, one, a lot of our brains power, computational power, I suppose, if everything is computation, is devoted to bodily processes, homeostasis, breathing, mm -hmm. you know, all these yeah, automatic yeah. processes that our brain has to uh, um, keep involved. I mean, is that something that you think, A, that should be, you know, do we need to even need to worry about those when we're building artificial systems? Uh, because they do have to interact, you mm -hmm. know, and they mm -hmm. do affect mm -hmm. our other domain yeah. general faculties yeah. or other uh, cognitive modules, etc. Um, so I, I guess that's the first question. And then the second question is just thinking about uh, the spectrum. You know, we we're talking about human level AI and maybe superhuman level AI, like protein folding, right? Um, but mm -hmm. then thinking about you know your background in animal cognition and thinking about the different kinds of domain general faculties, animals non-human organisms might possess is that something that we should be paying attention to or even you know can we even discern what those domain general faculties might be sorry those mm -hmm. were two mm -hmm. different questions to throw at you yeah let me let me take the first one before i forget it you might have to remind me of the second one um yeah. so the first question is is should let's say machine learning researchers worry about uh the more let's say autonomic and and lower level uh, processing that the brain does and seems to occupy a lot of uh, hardware space, let's say, in, in the brain. Is that is that fair enough, Construal? Fair, en fair enough. Interception, but also, you know, f yeah. yes. Yeah. And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think looking at the empiricists, again, is a great way to draw this, uh, to drive this point home. In particular, William James was someone who was, you know, often considered a kind of father of modern psychology, but also very emphatic on this point that uh, the kind of autonomic and interoceptive uh, aspects of cognition were just vitally important to understanding how mentality works and how we get around, especially with emotional processing. So, you know, if there was one really weak point uh, in recent deep learning achievements, I would say it's in the ability to model emotional responses or what Hume, you know, might've called sentiments. Uh, and th these emotional responses and sentiments play an enormous important role in all throughout, uh, you know, at least from early modern to, to today, empiricist theorizing about how the mind works. It's, uh, they, they give us, uh, kind of effective appraisals of, of how we should respond to situations and, all kinds of important information. And one place where this would be really useful uh, 
to be able to take advantage of in deep learning is in uh, valuation functions, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's there's maybe several dark arts to uh, deep learning today, but you know, w one of the trickiest dark arts I think is building a good valuation function for your reinforcement learning algorithm, right? And I think all of the modelers will be totally forthright about that. That uh, you know, when you're when you're dealing with a simple game like environment like Go or, you know, like an Atari game, okay, you can just use score or board control or whatever as a proxy for reward. But if you want to actually model rational agency more generally, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. You know, one of the points I make, and, and this get, ties back to some of the earlier points I made about, you know, anthropofabulation, which is sort of uh, assuming that the human mind is not vulnerable to some of the same problems that these artificial agents are. We are terrible at this too, right? Huh. A lot of the time when we're thrown, you know, H index or US News and World Report scores or, uh, you know, social media likes, we often use these, these easy quantitative proxies for value that are actually making us miserable and not leading us um, in the right direction. So the, again, this yeah. is a computational problem that both, uh, both, uh, computational systems and human brains uh, are faced with. And I think listening to the body, right, um, in particular as a rich multidimensional source of valuations uh, is one way that we solve this problem and that we really don't know yet how to integrate into deep learning. Uh, and there's lots, you know, there's lots of people making specific versions of this proposal. Um, you know, Lucy Cheek, one of my hosts here at Cambridge, uh, has suggested that in animal cognition, she's primarily an animal cognition researcher um, and, and developmental cognitive researcher, is that um, reinforcement learning in uh, deep learning today mostly focuses on a kind of like wanting system that you might map to the maybe dopaminergic system in the brain. But animals also have like needing and liking systems mm -hmm. that are more sort of like affective attachment and then more of like homeostasis kind of survival need. And they're kind of like different valuation systems and they're always kind of competing and playing off each other. Is and it Barrage? seems like, sorry, is that Kenneth Barrage? But am I, the, 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 the I don't know. She might be drawing on that. I, I first heard it from Lucy. So anyway, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. So, you know, the, the thought might be that uh, we need to build in more of these um, lower level valuation, whether they're sentiments, whether they're needing, liking and wanting, whether they're uh, effective appraisals, emotional reactions to uh, succeed in a lot of the places where uh, current deep learning agents, especially when they're released into kind of more open ended environments, uh, seem to to presently fail pretty badly at. And, and that's a place where I think we still maybe need a kind of technological leap forward before we can make real progress. We seem to still be missing something. The, the danger is always present of turning the machine's power off or something like that, where they have yeah. to <laughs> balance that. Okay, so I'll remind you of the other question, which was um, about animal cognition, and I'll slightly rephrase it. So we tend to, you know, I, I map up my emotions my thought process is onto my dog. My dog is sad. Mm -hmm. My dog is, my right. dog feels fear, right. you know, and these psychological constructs that we talk about and share through our own language and our own experiences as humans. And this goes back to like, you know, building human like AI or human level AI. Um, you know, how much, how much do we need to pay attention to potential domain general faculties of other organisms, non-human organisms, whether or not we can, put a name to them or say anything about what the actual experience is like for them. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you thinking again about like, uh, uh, faculties that humans don't have that animals not necessarily, have? but it, well, should we, let's say imagination, right? Would, would, yeah. is, is imagination a domain general faculty ontologically s sound, right? Is it a thing that actually exists in the universe that, a mm -hmm. squirrel also has or could have, or is it that the structure of a squirrel's brain yeah. and the, the, the way that um, the architectures interact and the, the um, neural activity interacts between modules in a squirrel's brain, does it develop mm -hmm. you know, a slightly different um, faculty, something that is not quite imagination or memory, but might be something else? You know? um, mm -hmm. Does that make sense?
it's a poorly asked sort of question. Uh, let me let me let me let me give a couple of examples. So I, I do think it could be the case that you know some animals lack some faculties that we have, uh, and other animals share faculties that we have. You know, ideally, once you had the kind of abstract mechanistic understanding of the structure uh, of the uh, of the internal structure of the faculty that allows it to play the roles that it needs to play to do the computational work that it needs to do, you would be able to use that understanding to see whether other animals have that faculty or not. Hmm. But looking at other, you know, it's, it's not that it's kind of just a one direction thing that you go from the computational modeling and then you go around and check other animals to see if they have it. Looking at other animals can actually help us figure out what's the right level of abstraction at which to cast the faculty's nature as well. An example I often like to bring up here is like echolocation and cognitive mapping, right? So in animal cognition, there's this, there's tons and tons of papers like do, does X species have a cognitive map? You know, do bees have a cognitive map? Do rats have a cognitive map? Do chimpanzees have a cognitive map? Right. And in humans, there's all this great neuroscience, you know, some won the Nobel prize for uh, showing how the dentate gyrus and the hippocampus and the antral cortex, uh, uh, cooperate together to allow us to build cognitive maps of our environment, right? And based on that level of understanding, we have about, you know, how place cells and grid cells work. We can look then at other organisms and see like, well, should they have it or not? But if, if we didn't have that level of understanding yet, you, you might look at bats and say like, well, bats can't have a cognitive map because they can't see well enough. That's a case, right, where I would think there's like a clear mistake being made uh, akin to anthropofabulation where you think like uh, the only way you could have this faculty is by exhibiting it in the distinctively human-like way you know whereas humans mostly have visual cognitive maps based on visual landmarks but why couldn't an echolocating organism have you know echolocating cognitive maps based on acoustic feedback um, landmarks you know so so that that's a kind of case where you can you can help decide what's really core to this faculty and its ability to do its computational work uh, and what's uh, just a kind of contingent way that it's implemented in us by looking at other biological organisms. And that can help you maybe decide what you should build into your artificial organisms as well. You have time for some forward looking content? Yeah, yeah. And it's, so, I mean, of course, I think it's actually related to a lot of the other stuff we've talked about. Well, um, yeah, I, so. I was about to say other, you know, non-human animals or organisms don't possess language. Although mm -hmm. you said language is within the attention uh, camp. Of course, most animals have, well, you would assume, have attentional mechanisms, right? Because they have to figure yeah. out what to pay attention to in the environment, top down and bottom up. Um, but, but they don't have like the symbolic lingual processing and I, we don't need to go down the um, whether language requires symbolic thought, etc. But uh, I use that as a segue, um, thinking of symbols and the symbol grounding problem and representation. You've had a, a long interest in meaning. And mm -hmm. uh, so we're switching gears here to talk about your account of representational content. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to kind of throw the floor open to you because I'm aware of the, our time and maybe we shouldn't go down in too much into the weeds. But... Um, I'm one, so maybe you can summarize your the forward-looking content account with respect to both teleosemantics, which you'll have to define, but also just uh, selfishly, since I've had Mark Bickhard on the podcast, and there's some overlap between mm -hmm. his interactivism uh, and, mm -hmm. and representations as anticipations of future uh, mm -hmm. events based on our actions, and your account as well, although... Yeah. I know that your account involved is, is much more intertwined with learning, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a mouthful, but what, what is the forward looking content view? Yeah, let me, let me motivate it a little bit. So I, yeah. I first got interested in this topic, uh, by looking at very similar debates in animal cognition. Okay. So, you know, one of the debates I looked at is, um, do animals have a theory of mind, which is, you know, maybe you think of it like a sub faculty of, um, social cognition. Okay. Right, which is the ability to attribute beliefs and desires to other agents. And so there's a bunch of experiments showing that, you know, chimpanzees and I worked on some experiments with ravens and a bunch of other animals can attribute at least perceptual states to other organisms, kind of simple theory of mind. Uh, 
And then skeptics, though, would look at that work and say, uh, no, those aren't theory of mind because I can come up with a simple associative explanation for those results, right? Where it's all in terms of observable cues uh, that the animal was seeing at the time. Uh, and they didn't actually posit some underlying mental state uh, like they had a theory of mind. Do you understand the basic opposition? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So as a philosopher of science, the thing that I found very funny about these debates is that if you sat the two sides down and you said, okay, so what do you think the animal can actually do? And you describe a series of situations, they agree completely. They, they like agree on all the behavioral capacities and they agree on all the experimental data and they have a very hard time coming up with a future experiment that could possibly arbitrate between the two positions that the animal does or doesn't have a theory of mind. And that's a place where the philosopher says like, maybe this is actually a philosophical disagreement, right? Rather than an empirical one or, you know, there's not, I'm not somebody who's like, there's a big sharp divide between a philosophical theory. I think all philosophical theories should have at least some empirical content to them, but you know, at least there's a kind of semantic disagreement here, right? Because if I put the disagreement, like you think this animal has a representation of a perceptual state. Yes. You think this animal does not have a representation of a perceptual state? Yes. Okay, so that's what you disagree about. Now let's talk about your theories of representation. They've been, well, you know, I've been around enough philosophers to know that that's, that's a sticky business. That's deep water. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm reluctant to put it all on the table. But Daniel Pavanelli, you know, uh, love him for this. Like, he's willing to put all his cards on the table and say, like, you know, look, uh, I think that they should have a representation that like really causally co-varies with the underlying mental strait across like this very wide, maybe potentially totally open-ended number of different situations. And that's where I want to say, no, that's anthropofabulation, right? Because humans don't have that ability, mm -hmm. right? Humans can only infer uh, that other humans have particular mental states on the basis of observable behavior. Like we're not psychic, right? So we also have to use observable cues that you could tell some sufficiently sophisticated associative story about if you know you had a, a complex enough model uh that could learn those cues and, and make the same predictions um so there was a there's a pattern there and it's now the pattern that i also see in artificial intelligence uh today between the skeptics and the proponents of kind of ambitious interpretations of what deep mo deep learning models are doing where you see some results, some experimental results, either from the animal or from a new deep neural network system, where they do some cool behavior. And then the, the kind of enthusiast says, you know, ah, look, you know, it's like object detection or it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like imagination, you know, like Dolly 2's doing some creativity, you know, is another word that gets thrown around. Right. Um, and then the skeptic says, no, that's just statistics or that's just pattern matching or that's just, you know, linear algebra. That's not really that thing. And you have to say, well, what's really the criteria for having that capacity? And it always comes down to representations in one way or another, right? So in the animal cognition debate, it came down to what is it to have a representation of a distal mental state, like a perception, I see some particular thing or I believe some particular thing. In this case, right, like what the skeptics want in deep learning are core knowledge concepts, right? So it's what is it to have a concept of an object or what is it to have a concept of a cause? These are, again, debates that are ultimately cast in representational terms, right? So it doesn't seem like you can arbitrate the dispute empirically unless the two sides agree on what it is to have a representation of that concept. And that's where if you ask them, you see that the two sides have different implicit theories of representation. In particular, the skeptics game, right? is they all they think they need to do is show a few cases where the other system makes some apparent mistake that they think humans wouldn't make to say, aha, look, see, I exposed the fraud, right? They don't have that capacity. But humans make all kinds of mistakes too, right? So if you want to say like, well, humans have a true concept of causation that um, deep neural networks don't have, even deep neural networks that are trained to solve causal inference problems, there's all these famous studies that show that, you know, even Harvard undergraduates that just finished and got a high grade in a physics course, when you take them out of the classroom and you ask them these simple physics problems, 
they make these very elementary correlation causation and in uh, weird like uh, impetus principle mistakes uh, that it seems like if they'd just done a few calculations on a napkin they could have gotten the right answer but they they still seem to have these mistakes like very deeply ingrained in them that seem more applicable to a kind uh, interpretable in terms of a kind of statistical theory of how things are going on so it can't just be making some mistakes any mistakes that the ideal reasoner wouldn't make uh, rules you out of the realm of the agents that could have this concept, you know, whether it's causation or a belief of a, or a mental state or whatever. Uh, but then you actually have to do the hard work to say, okay, so which mistakes are disqualifying and which ones aren't? And that's where you need a kind of principled th philosophical theory, I think, right? Now, if you go back into the 80s in, you know, the, the kind of heyday of the theory of representation, uh, attempts to naturalize representation from like Fodor, Millikan, Dretzky, uh, teleosemantics like you mentioned earlier, they all start from the perspective that this simple causal theory of content where to have a representation of X, you have to have some neural state that perfectly causally co-varies with X is false and obviously false, right? Because we all make mistakes misrepresentation in other words is just like a basic fact of mentality uh there's no concept we have that we have we never make a mistake with respect to it so we need some different principle that determines whether we have a representation of some particular content x that doesn't require perfect use in other words and all of the different teleosemantic theories are an attempt to pick some principle that doesn't require perfect use, but still ascribes determinate contents. Okay. I used to, do you have a follow-up question before I go deeper into it or are we okay so far? I'm okay, but I've, I know these I've are deep your, philosophical waters. I know I, I've read your work, so I, I'm keeping up, but you know, I, who knows, but, uh, okay. I'm so, so I, I don't know what to ask you for clarification. So, yeah. And a lot of them, for example, were appealing to evolutionary theory uh, or theory of information. So Dretzky's theory, for example, which was my favorite and is called the teleosemantic theory, uh, it tries to decide, okay, so what's the function of the representation? That's how you're going to decide what is the determinant content of the representation without requiring perfect use. You need to figure out what its function is. And the way you figure out its function, according to Dretzky, is to look at the representation's learning history. So he interprets learning as a function bestowing process. Okay, so what learning does is it like picks up what he calls indicators that are, you know, say a neural state that, you know, maybe in the perceptual cortex or whatever that happens to be activated whenever some particular uh, thing in the environment happens. That then, at least in that particular circumstance, so let's say we're in a, a brightly lit room and I have a particular neural state that uh, lights up whenever I see my water bottle in this brightly lit room. Uh, and I learned that, you know, that water bottle affords drinking when I'm thirsty. Then I might recruit that neural state through learning. You know, Dretzky talks about simple operant conditioning to control my drinking movements, my, you know, grasping and drinking movements. Okay. Like a rat can do that. Uh, but then turn out the lights, right? And in some sense, the water bottle is still there, but that same neural state maybe doesn't fire. You know, I need to learn that the water bottle looks differently or I need to use haptic feedback or whatever to find the water bottle in the dark. But that doesn't mean I don't have a concept of a water bottle, you know, or a representation of a water bottle, according to Dretzky. He can still say, well, that, that representation still indicates the water bottle. It still means the water bottle in his sense because it has the function of indicating the water bottle. Right, because that's what it was recruited to do in those previous conditions. So, so the now representation the part, yeah. is the function, or sorry, I'm going to jump in when the, I can with that the, the representation is just a neural state. It has a function. It's it's sort of like bestowed a function by learning. When that representation is recruited to control some uh, desire satisfying movements. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So you, you kind of get the, the teleology from the 
the agency aspect of it, right? The idea being that you're, you're a system with needs that need to be met and you're thrust into an environment where you don't know how to meet those needs. And learning is a system that picks certain perceptual brain states or whatever and bestows them with certain functions through this process of recruitment to control certain movements uh, because it was successful in satisfying that need when it triggered those movements in those circumstances in the past. In the past right. is key here, right? Because it's a right. historically looking right. way of talking about rep what a representation is. Because right. at every moment, we are our best and perf most perfect selves, and our representations are always backward right. looking in that respect. Right. Uh, and that, the backward looking aspect is the part of it that always bothered me. I thought Dretzky's story was, you know, brilliant, ingenious. Uh, and if you interpret his covariation condition in the past recruitment situation strictly, that is anything that causally covariated with it in the past, all and only that thing is the content of the representation, then it solves this indeterminacy problem, which is a horribly difficult problem to solve. And it's one of the only views I think that actually solves this problem. But then it's wait, like, wait, wait. sorry, it's, sorry, state the indeterminacy problem again, or, or I, I can maybe state it and you can then correct me. It's that you can't um, or just correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you, it's, it's, you can't look back and say which strand of possible historical contingencies right, led up exactly. to this um, modern in the now content of the representation. Yeah. So, I mean, a standard way of painting the indeterminacy picture is uh, you, you have a frog and you, you've got a frog who sticks out its tongue to eat flies, right? So you want to say, oh, well, the frog's uh, representation means flies. And then, you know, the skeptic says, ah, but what if I flick little BBs in front of the frog? Uh, and the frog's tongue sticks out and eats those too. So what is the content of the representation, right? Is it, uh, is it fly? Because that was what, uh, caused, uh, the, the, that particular perceptual representation to control tongue darting movements due to some evolutionary selection. You know, some of the more evolutionary oriented teleosemantic theories might say that. Um, is it, BBs because it now darts to select BBs or is it some this is the really tricky one to rule out is it some more proximate construal that is shared with both uh, flies and BBs like small dark moving speck right so in some sense you want to say like the fly is the more teleologically satisfying answer because that's what actually solves the need but anytime it indicated fly right it also indicated small dark moving speck Right. And what does what does Dretzky so say about the frog? So it it changed. I mean, one of the, it depends on which time slice of Dretzky we're talking oh, about no. is one of the things. So yeah. yeah. So like many great philosophers, you know, his views kind of evolved over the years, um, and he he played with different notions of indication. So there's a strict notion of indication. So it's only what it you know actually covaried with in that particular circumstance. And there's another more open-ended notion. So it's anything that sort of like could have covaried with um, that had this. And so that's the particular tension that I wanted my view to solve, where you both need. So on Dretzky's view, let me say, just to clarify how misrepresentation is possible on Dretzky's view. It's, you know, it's this is the part of the story that's implausible to me is you can miss. You can have a representation of the water bottle, even when your representation later doesn't perfectly causally covary with the water bottle. That is, you make some mistakes. Either you grab something that looks like the water bottle, but it's really a you know, duplicate, or you fail to grab the water bottle when it's right in front of you because the lights are out. Those are two types of mistakes, right? On Dresky's view, it's okay to make those mistakes. You, that doesn't like mean you're not competent with the concept of the water bottle because it has the content of indicating water bottle given its recruitment history. And it's only later when you're out of that same environment of recruitment that you make the mistake, right? Okay. So for Dretzky, like you can't make a mistake during recruitment. It's, it's like logically impossible. And then mistakes are possible only later when you move to a different environment that has different contingencies. And that both aspects of that all, always struck me as wrong, you know, as ingenious as the view was because we make mistakes all throughout learning. You know, if you watch a kid learning to do something and we recognize them as mistakes while we're learning, 
And in fact, it's crucial that we recognize them as mistakes while we're learning, because that's how learning works, right? If you look at the acquisition of expertise, for example, in any domain, you see that an agent that just kind of blunders along with trial and error is never going to become an expert at that subject, right? You have to attend to the causes of your successes and failures and try to like actively diagnose where you went wrong and then correct your, what we, I might call conception of the thing that you were trying to interact with as a result of the mistake that you made to sort of get closer and improve your use. And that's how learning works all throughout the trajectory. And so I thought any of you that sort of like couldn't make sense of that is just misrepresenting the way that learning works as a matter of empirical fact. So what I wanted was a view that would um, save the, the parts of Dretzky's view that were ingenious in work, but not have misrepresentation be derivative of this kind of artificial construal of learning, where you don't make mistakes during the recruitment history, and then you only make mistakes later when you're in a different environment that has a different contingency structure from the environment in which you learn. And so the forward-looking view is supposed to help with that. Now, you know, the forward-looking story, it, just to give, make a long story short, is you now don't ground content descriptions in the agent's learning history or evolutionary history for that matter. You rather ground them in the agent's own dispositions to respond to representational errors. Okay. So, you know, go back to the frog. The idea is if I'm in doubt whether the frog's representation means fly or BB, I expose the frog through some, you know, open-ended interactions to lots of flies and lots of BBs and see what it does. Now, if it stops responding to the BBs over a long enough period of time, then I want to say it treated it like a mistake to respond to those BBs in the learning trajectory. And so it was always aiming at something else, you know, maybe fly. If, however, it continues to eat BBs until it, you know, gets a belly full of lead, as I think frogs actually do, then this view would say, well, it lacks the, the capacity to revise that representation to better indicate flies. And so it actually does mean something that encompasses both fly and BB, like small, dark, moving spec. And I think some animals are like that, and some animals aren't, right? Like some animals are more flexible, where they can learn to better indicate uh, the reference of their concepts uh, through further interaction with the environment, maybe potentially open-ended. And I, again, I like to think of expertise here where you can learn to get better and better at, at indicating something, you know, for decades. Uh, so th it's not like there's some definitive point at which learning stops. But if you're ever in doubt as to what the function of this representation is in the cognitive economy, we should be deferring not to some magic recruitment period, but rather to the agent's own dispositions to detect and respond to representational errors. Now, that's the, I like that view also because it suggests ways to do experiments when you're in one of these situations where you're not sure whether, say, you know, the Raven experiment I talked about earlier, for example, was inspired by this type of view, uh, whether you're not sure whether the Raven has a representation of another Raven's uh, perceptual state or uh, merely some a current cue for that perceptual state like gaze like direction of the, the raven's head or eyes, which was the, uh, the skeptic's preferred explanation for all the data that had come before, right? They'd say, well, the raven doesn't really understand anything about seeing. It's just using this simple uh, associative cue of where the raven's eyes, the other raven's eyes are pointed. Uh, and so it doesn't need to understand anything about mentality. So what it says is you need to now make a further experiment where the raven has an opportunity to learn about some other cues that indicate seeing that are not gaze-like. And that's the, that's the type of experiment that we did, and the ravens seemed to pass. Uh, so the thought would be, according to the forward-looking view, if the raven can uh, recruit a potentially open-ended number of other uh, cues to indicate that, that same shared disposition and, and to which it responds in the same type of way and generalize its previous behaviors to these new cues, then that suggests that the Raven's representation was all along aimed at, you know, perceptual state like seeing rather than just gaze, which it would stop responding to if gaze stopped indicating the thing it actually cares about seeing. Um, 
And it further suggests a way now in machine learning, I think, you know, I, I don't talk about this in the book because I'm worried I would scare off all the machine learning researchers if I started going all this theory of representation stuff. <laughs> but, you know, it suggests a way to arbitrate these disputes where, you know, Gary Marcus goes on Twitter and he says, you know, look, I gave Dolly to the prompt, you know, three blue squares in front of three red squares. And, you know, look, it got the squares in the wrong order. It painted them the wrong color. Well, if you gave Dolly to the opportunity to learn about those situations and whether it got the answer right or not, and you gave it that kind of training. So, right, like a lot of people who are responding to this to say, well, this type of situation or these types of relations were just not in the Dolly 2's uh, training. So why think that it would be good because of the kind of captions that people put on pictures on the Internet or whatever? Why would you think that it would be able to succeed at that? If it could learn to uh, better indicate those relations through further rounds of training, online training, especially where it's detecting its own errors, right? So, you know, if it's all just supervised learning, I might be more skeptical of applying the forward-looking story and saying that it actually has the representation. But if we built systems that have the kind of self-supervision of the sort that like Lacoon is, um, has been recommending for the last few years, then I would start to say, you know, look, we have now a way to ask the system what it really has a representation of by seeing whether it can get better at doing this by detecting its own representational errors and improving its use as a result. We still don't really have that, that interaction and, and sort of uh, unguided self-supervised learning, or, or at least we don't have um, deployable yeah. state-of-the-art systems doing that yet, but I'm sure it's just around the corner. Yeah. But if you took a, um, thinking about like an Oracle, let's say you train up a machine learning um, model and it answers everything, then you freeze its weights so it can't learn, yeah. and it answers, you know, 100 questions correctly. Does that have content then? Would you say that has content yeah. because it doesn't have to, doesn't even, it doesn't get a chance to, nor does it need to yeah. improve because its predictions matched its its output? Yeah. And then what about the, uh, the old guy next door who you, you can't teach him anything, he already knows everything? Maybe old, do yeah. old, older people who become more brittle or more um, obstinate in their opinions? Or do they have less content or are they lacking content in their representations? Is that what I should tell old man Henderson over yeah, there? Yeah, gosh, gosh, you're going to get me in trouble. But but yeah, I think actually. Oh, wow. All right. Probably. That's okay. um, gutsy. They at least have different contents uh, okay. than you do. So, I mean, the way I look at it is it, it's not like actual futures that matter. So it's not like what you're actually going to do in the next 30 years. It's rather... Uh, based on what you know now and the learning dispositions that you have currently, if you had an open-ended exploration of this environment, how would you respond or how would we predict that you would respond over time? That's, that's what really matters for the, the content description on my view. Um, so a more flexible, I, I think this is the right answer, a much more flexible learning system can have much more variegated and specific contents than a much less flexible learning system, you know, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in some of these cases too, like, like it looks maybe to us like somebody's making a mistake when they say like, no, I'm fine. And like you pointed out to them and like, ah, no, it's fine for me. Who are we to say they're making a mistake, right? Like maybe that's really the content that they were after, right? Um, and, and again, I think that's ultimately why deferring to the agent's own capacity and dispositions to revise is the right answer, because that's what's going to make the right predictions about their future behavior, right? I think the content descriptions should be earning their keep uh, as, as psychological posits, right, in virtue of making empirical predictions that are borne out by uh, experiments or, or interactions with the, the agents that have those contents. Right. And so for me, that that's, that's again, sort of what always bothered me about the backward looking gamut is that you're making lots of predictions about what this agent is going to do. If you ascribe contents that are like too ambitious for its own learning capacities, you're saying like, it's, you're predicting it's going to eat a bunch of flies that it just like can't see, or you're predicting it's not going to eat a bunch of BBs that it, you know, repeatedly is going to eat until it, it fills its stomach completely. Um, Whereas the forward-looking gambit, again, it, it makes it possible to make mistakes, but the mistakes should not be systematic, right? In the sense that they should not persist indefinitely. If you make a mistake, it should the agent should treat it like a mistake and be less likely to do that thing again in the future in the similar circumstances. And I think that's ultimately why 
Content descriptions are useful to scientists, not just to philosophers, is because they help us make a kind of prediction that it seems like we couldn't make otherwise. You know, you can call it whatever you want, but you would need to invent a new type of posit to predict how a dynamic system, and maybe I'm starting to sound like Bickhart here, but like how a dynamic system is going to interact with its environment over time, uh, where it's, it's not a static thing. Neither the environment nor the agent is, is static. You need to, you know, I often say if you want to shoot an arrow, you need to aim where the target is headed, not where it's been. And, and I think that's the way to look at content descriptions in psychology and, and machine learning. Do you, you just mentioned Bickhart, and that was part of my original question. Do you, do you feel comfortable uh, just comparing his uh, account of representations and I guess content? I, I don't think he appeals to learning necessarily, although it, he, he does allow for misrepresentation in the fact that you, ha mm -hmm. you can have like multiple different anticipatory futures that you're anticipating, mm -hmm. and that is the representation. And then one can be wrong or right, and that's how you can misrepresent. And then I guess learning mm -hmm. is implicit in that. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, I'm not sure I want to do a uh, uh, Bickhart interpretation, but I, I do list him in the paper as, as, yeah. as an, another type of forward-looking view um, that, was, that was inspirational. He, I think he focuses a lot more on the structure of anticipatory mechanisms in a way yeah. that I don't, but I generally yeah. agree with. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I focus on this, this kind of global total agent level um, Right. revision mechanism because i think that's the most useful to focus on for the purposes of animal cognition uh but i think there's also a lot of other anticipatory mechanisms and he describes them you know much better than than i do all right cameron i've taken you long enough i appreciate your patience with me and uh and <laughs> no thanks and i hope it was useful oh we've gone down a long road yeah so yeah thanks for being on yeah thank you Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stair